Welcome to Built on Air, a podcast and video series about all things Airtable. In this episode, we're joined by cultural advocate, author, and operations specialist, Paul Matsushima. We begin with the discussion of how his background in nonprofit work helping establish and expand Japanese American cultural programs in the LA region led him to co authoring a children's book and creating a youth summer camp. We then discuss how his role as an operations specialist led him to use Airtable to quickly organize and automate reporting processes with the aid of Zapier to integrate with other productivity apps. Paul showcases two bases for us, the first being a ledger to track annual financial transactions and the second being a CRM to track contracts, campaigns, and communications. We get a deep dive in both bases, both of which are available for public use on the Airtable universe. Um, Since I mentioned it already, I'll start off with the financial ledger. So uh, this is the scrub version. This one is on the Airtable universe. And there are five types of tables. Um, There are transactions, which are the individual monetary transactions like purchases, payments, deposits. There are contacts. So these are the people either who are spending money or giving money to us. There are expense codes. So these are basically like individual light items like groceries, um, you know, fast food, coffee, right? Things like that. There are are fund orgs. So these are essentially a pot of money, right? So like it might be your bank account through Bank of America, bank bank account number two through Chase Bank. And then the final one is uh, I call them the grants because our organization works a lot with grant deliverables. Uh, grant foundations. And so we have a lot of deliverables and we have to track these different from what the expense count codes would be tracked. Um, and so it's a set. So the grants are kind of like tags. So like if you use a software uh, like mint.com, um, you know, there's there's both the expense codes and then there are tags. So this, this is just another way to, um, to, to, I guess, name uh, certain line item or transactions. So uh, in terms of transactions, what I do, my process is uh, one of my direct reports, she is the one who inputs all transactions. So she would, you know, input the, pers- the, the, the pot of money or the fund org that a transaction goes into, what the expense code is, what the amount is. So negative is, you know, um, uh, a debit and then a positive is a credit. The date uh, she has su- submitted it, the description, you can put the contact the stage, so stage is like where in the process of submitting this information is it? Um, And then I go in and then I review the transactions and then I basically, uh, this has a filter. So if if I list it as like, I reviewed it by the supervisor, then that thing would disappear and it would go into all transactions. So yeah, that's, that's the basic inputting uh, for transactions. So you input all the information there and then this, this information is the main information. And then from this, these transactions, you could pull different reports. So I've built in some reports. So you can see at a glance, um, my, my direct supervisors always want a report of how we're doing in terms of how many donations we've received, how many grants we've received, as well as how much uh, product income, because we sell, um, you know, we, we earn revenue through products as well. So uh, at any given time, you can see like, what types of gifts we've received, who's given uh, the amount and then the date and then which pot of money or which fund org it belongs to, how many grants. And these are all fake names, fictitious names like Bart Simpson, <laughs> my Adidas. Um, uh, what, what type of income has been given as well. And then we're, our organization also receives royalties from some books as well. So that's one type of report you can do uh, in expense codes. You can see at a glance all the funds. So uh, you could, like we have a general fund, you could see the budget, what what the budget is for each fiscal year. You could see the actuals, how much you've actually spent and then the variance. Um, And then, you know, like grant, budget number two would be grant one and then budget number, there's there's additional um, budgets you could have. Um, and then you could see each one individually. So like if you only wanted to see general fund, you could see the general fund budget, the actuals, and then the variance between the two. Um, I've broken down the expense codes by income. So we have like gifts, grants, miscellaneous income, royalties, uh, project expenses. So these are things like general supplies, 
dues and subscriptions, um, consultants and contractors, and then salary expenses as well, and then the benefits. Uh, another report is a PL report, which is an income statement. So um, at a glance, you could see like how much have we budgeted for unrestricted gifts? And then what is the actual amount we have received? And then what is the variance between the two? Um, and then let's see what else. In the fund orgs, so you could see a summary and then a description of each fund org. So this is the general fund, right? This might be the grant number one fund. This is for our grant, which runs from fiscal year 20 to 25. Um, and then you could see how much income we've actually received, how much expenses we've actually made, and then how much cash is available, and then which transactions and grant deliverable line items are, are connected to each. Um, another helpful report is the cash on hand, which uh, really shows um, how much money do you have in each fund org at any given time, right? And the cash available is, and we'll say, oh, this one has negative $3,000, uh-oh, this, but this one has a positive, right? So it shows a, a, a good, and then in the grants, um, uh, it has a monthly breakdown. So you can see what is budgeted for the entire fiscal year, and then how much we have, you know, spent, uh, what, what is the real number of both ex expenses and income in July and August and September, et cetera, et cetera. So across all of your uh, tables, you're using um, filters on various different views mm -hmm. and also grouping by either a linked field or sometimes a single select field. Mm -hmm. For the table we're currently looking at grants, you have, um, I, I would assume, one roll up per month of the year. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you update at the end of the year to switch from say July, 2020 to July, 2021? Yeah, so uh, what I would do at the end of the fiscal year, which for us is in June, um, at uh -huh. the end of June, I would basically um, empty out all, all of these fund orgs, right? Um, so I, I would basically just uh, transfer all the money. I, I, sorry, before I do that, I would duplicate this base for the next fiscal year, and then I would empty out all the money here and then transfer it into, you know, the, since we're in fiscal year 21 right now, I would transfer it into fiscal year 22 um, so that at the end, this cash available should say zero for every single fund org. And then, okay. uh, yeah, so that's, that's how I would do it. So you would archive the whole base, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. So this would only be a one year base. Yeah. Good question. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that it it's just easier for you that way to just work in one fiscal year at a time? You've never needed to like look at old records. Yeah, I, I occasionally will look at old records, but it's kind of rare. Um, and, and I found that Airtable for this in particular is much, I used to do this on a Google spreadsheet. Um, but Airtable's filters and views and, you know, all those things are just so much better. Uh, and, and, and the ability to click into individual contacts and see, like, for instance, what are the transactions linked with each one has, has just made this much more powerful. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And now that I think about it, it does make sense to just archive um, an old fiscal year and work on information that only pertains to now. Mm -hmm. um, great. Um, so how long have you been using this system? Uh, I've actually only been using it since uh, about June of this year. So about half a year. Yeah. Because previously, um, you know, I used Google Spreadsheets and mm -hmm. it did the job, but it was kind of messy at the end of the year. So this, uh, since transferring over to this, it's made my life a whole lot easier. Um, and I like how the, the reports that I showed you are basically updated in real time whenever transactions are entered. Um, and so, you know, I, I just send that report over to my bosses and at any given time they could check the link and the, they'll have a live update of, of like how much money we have in the bank um, or how much we've spent for a given month. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, do you use any of the apps to like maybe make a chart out of this data or do you typically just find yourself needing the grid view sort of layout? Yeah, for now, I mainly use the grid view. Um, I haven't experimented too much with the, uh, 
with the charts or the other apps that are out there. Um, if, if we have time to talk about the CRM I built, um, I, uh, I, I use other, other views than just the grid view, yeah. Mm -hmm. I do believe we will have time. Okay. But uh, before we switch <laughs> over, one last thing. Um, so with um, using this system, you were saying that you could just easily hand off um, a report to any of your coworkers or supervisors. How many people use this base on a day-to-day? -day? I know someone puts in the transactions. Mm -hmm. Is it more like one or two people use it every day and, and then maybe once a week you guys all check in? Yeah, I would say um, two of us use it on, almost on a daily basis. So uh, uh, the person I supervise is the one who inputs all of the transactions into this. And then I'm the one who, who reviews everything. And then um, the my two bosses are the ones who check this probably on a weekly basis, just to make sure where we're at in terms of our finances. Yeah. yeah. I like to ask about how teams use Airtable and seeing if if there's if there was any kind of like stumbling blocks in getting each member of the team to know where to look for the right thing. Has it been like a smooth transition in the past six months you've used it? Yeah, yeah, I, I think um, yeah, I, I think every everyone is uh, pleased with it. Um, I, I I think it's made our lives it just, you know, the air, air table interface, user interface is just so much cleaner to look at and prettier to look at as well. So I think it makes the information uh, much more easily, easy to, to view. Yeah. I would agree. Um, so let's take a look at the CRM now. Okay, great. So uh, one of the first things I did actually was I created what's called a data integration strategy. And this was recommended to me through Salesforce because I, I used Salesforce before uh, using Airtable for our CRM. Uh, but essentially a, a data integration strategy is where you, you think about all the, the, da the data that comes into your organization, whether it's financial transactions, emails through a newsletter, uh, you know, followers on, on social media, comments on your WordPress blogs, right? Any piece of data that flows in and out of your organization. And you think, uh, what, what information do I need to capture? What platform should that information be stored on? And then how can the platforms interact with one another so that it automates things so that you're not having to manually update everything. So for instance, with the financial, um, you know, the transactions that I just showed you with that, that Airtable base. Um, what's not on here is I, I created a Zapier integration where anytime a transaction that is listed as a gift or a grant or a product income, that information automatically gets imported into the CRM database. And then th once it's imported into the CRM database, then it, it automates over to MailChimp because, uh, and it, it tags the person in MailChimp as a, as a, uh, purchaser or a customer, I should say. Um, so that was helpful to me to create that data integration strategy because it gives it gives us a robust picture of all the data that's flowing in and out of our organization and what we need to capture. Um, and so for the CRM uh, that I built on Airtable, you know, some of the pieces of information that we capture is one is campaigns, and campaigns are essentially anything from events programs, projects, product sales, or donor uh, donation drives that we do. Accounts are households or organizations. Um, contacts are the individuals within the households or organizations. Opportunities are basically payments or donations. Involvements are um, individuals who are involved with the campaigns and who are also linked to our contacts. And then our communications log are essentially like interactions. So they are like, uh, emails that we receive, phone calls we receive, comments on our WordPress or um, on our website. Yeah, so uh, the campaigns are, you know, the, the sort of the biggest piece of information that we have. And I, all, all the opportunities and the involvements are linked to any individual campaign. So one example of a campaign is we might have a masterclass for, say, for instance, we, we do a masterclass for MailChimp, right? How to teach people how to how to do MailChimp. So people sign up for that. Um, the opportunities would be listed here uh, as you know a product income for that a purchase person purchased, 
and then connected to that is their also their um, their involvement and connected to the involvement is the connected opportunity. So we can see both the person who, because because you know sometimes a, a like a for instance a parent might pay for the class, but then the kid is the one who actually attends the class, right? Sure. So that's why we have two two different opportunities and involvements. Um, uh, in the campaign, on the campaign table, uh, I've I've listed both active campaigns as well as campaign reports. So the campaign report would just show a, a quick glimpse as to like if it's if the campaign is in progress, what the end date is in progress versus completed versus aborted versus you know um, in, in, in uh, deferred, right? Uh, the end dates, um, how many. Uh, so the involve the involvements I, I broke them out uh, because involvements could be anything from like a participant, a facilitator, a staff member, a volunteer. Um, so uh, I, I listed out how many participants are in any given campaign, and then versus how many others. So that would include like a staff member, or a volunteer, right? And then how many uh, opportunities are listed as well, and then what is the total amount of opportunities in any given campaign? So you'd give it, get that robust um, uh, view. Um, accounts are pretty self-explanatory. They're just the household or in the, uh, households or organizations, and that just includes like uh, contact information as well as um, you know like uh, any information about the individual organization or household. Um, contacts are also pretty self-explanatory as well. It's just contact information. Um, I have like race and ethnicity, gender, their age. Uh, their work or profession, the involvements that are linked, um, the number of involvements, and then opportunities, number of opportunities, and then the total given, and then any communications that are connected to that uh, contact. And then I'll, I also have a do not contact as well. So say, for instance, a person gives us a bad review or for some reason is, is frustrated at us, we, we have a thumbs down to, to, so we would know do not contact that person. In opportunities, uh, this lists everything. Um, I'll go to all opportunities. So I sorted it by groups, and, and it is grouped by campaign. Um, and it has everything from, you know, the person involved, what the amount is, the date that they made the opportunity, uh, whether it's posted. So it could be not yet begun, prospecting, pledge, posted, declined the type, so whether it could be like a gift, a grant, product income, royalty. Um, and then because we are a nonprofit organization, we list, we work with donors. So we have a thank you status. So was this person thanked, to be thanked, do not thank, or does not need to be thanked? And then what is the date of thanking them? Um, let's see, uh, another helpful uh, view is I, I did newest, meaning we need to process it. So it, it is sorted by when the individual uh, opportunity was created. And, and these are usually created through our Zapier connection with our financial, um, uh, financial air, air table base. And so I can go in and sort by you know, the newest created and then I can update them with the particular information that needs to be updated. And then I also have another view called to do thank you. So these are all like, say for instance, we get a bunch of donations. These would list all the individuals that need to be still be thanked in our pipeline. And then once the person, once we send an acknowledgement letter to those individuals, we would list this as thanked. And then we would put the date, say for say today, right? What is today's the 22nd? And then it would go down to thanked. Um, let's see. These are pledged uh, accounts. Actually, I'm not going to talk about that one. And then we also have a, a report. So this would show a, a high level view of like how much money we have received um, by campaign, essentially, and all the individuals within that, that campaign. Um, involvements. Let's see, I did the same thing where I sorted it by newest so I can know when to process these and update them when needed. So if, say this one, for instance, doesn't have a contact, so I'll link it to someone. Um, I also have a, a view called leads. So these are all the individuals who have, maybe they signed up for an event or a webinar or something, but they haven't quite confirmed their participation. So um, these would be people that I would need to follow up with and, and, and confirm their participa 
participation in in in, from, in uh, the different campaigns we have. And then the email reports, I just created this. So it's it's basically like if I ever need to mass email or, or email individually people who are signed up for our, our campaigns, um, I could easily just copy and paste their information and then you know send them emails. And then our communications log is connected to several people in our organization's um, Gmail accounts. And so they just, in their Gmails, if they have certain emails that they want to save to our database. They just, you know, uh, categorize. I, I believe it's um, you. You just tag it in Gmail, and then Zapier does an automated thing, and then it appears here. So uh, we we save like the type. Usually, the title of the email. What is it about? Uh, what what type of of interaction is it? Right. Whether it's an email, phone call, social media, text, or WordPress. What are the comments? Is it a positive or negative view? And then who's the person connected to it? And if it's connected to any particular um, involvements or, or opportunities. And then we, we just have a couple of views for positive reviews as well as negatives. And then again, these negative reviews are connected to the person, right? Do not contact. So it just give us a sense of like, like be careful when you're interacting with these people because you might not want to contact them. Um, yeah. I have a question about the communications log. Sure. Um, if you have um, a lot of this coming in automatically through Zapier, mm -hmm. how much um, of the remaining fields, if there are any remaining fields, do you go back in and fill in yourself? Yeah, so this this part, um, we, we probably log maybe like 10 to 15 emails per day. So it's not a ton, it's not like thousands or anything like that. So uh, we usually have someone go in at the end of the week and, and just attach because uh, Gmail isn't the best at, at connecting contacts because if the person doesn't have their, their name uh, associated with their email, then um, this field is usually left blank. And so this one is, yeah, the per that's a good question though. That, this, that person would manually have to go in about once a week and update all their names. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and uh, I, sorry, uh, I, I mentioned before I used I used to use sales Salesforce to log all this information, but we just found that Salesforce was way too cumbersome for the amount of information we were collecting, um, and Airtable was just a much more user friendly, especially the onboarding process for others in our organization to adopt Airtable or to adopt our database in general. Um, I found that Airtable was much easier and much more user-friendly for individuals and cheaper, um, I should say as well, uh, than, than something like Salesforce. Sure, and it has the kind of added benefit of Airtable has its own in-house automations that are available, but it also has some pretty useful um, uh, adaptability for using Zapier or Integramat or Parabola, Parabola, I think is another one that um, allow you to transfer information back and forth between um, other services like Gmail, for mm -hmm. instance. Um, so uh, even if it's not completely out of the box functionality available in Airtable, there is usually an integration that's readily available to kind of help you automate some of your process along. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you were able to find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so would you say that the communications log is the one that's getting the most um, automated input from and in the rest of the base is more or less manual? Or is it, um, do you have other integrations running for this base as well? Yeah, we have other integrations, but the communications log is by far the most automated one and the one that is getting the most uh, use. Um, but we, so for our campaigns, we run a lot of, uh, we have a lot of forms. We used to use Google Forms for signing people up for our, like our events or our webinars, but we've switched over to Gravity Forms, which integrates well with our WordPress website. And so people fill out a form through Gravity Forms and then that has a good Zapier integration, which then connects to um, you know our, this this base. So all that information would automatically be tracked or automatically be automated through through Zapier. Um, yeah, and then our opportunities, uh, all of the donations, and then product revenue that we receive. Once it is 
inputted into our financial ledger in Airtable, then the Zapier would would um, connect to this this database, and then that's how the opportunities get logged. Here. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so it just it just goes to show that you could have multiple different Zaps going, mm -hmm. filling in the same base, but all from different sources. Yeah. This 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 particular base probably has like five or six Zaps uh, connected to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, would you, are you the one that kind of maintains them or is that like a shared duty just in case? I mean, once you set up a, a zap, it, it will work until something about Airtable or something about Gmail changes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm the one who sets them all up and figures out how to do it. And then I have others who, who maintain and, and update the data and make, you know, keep, keep all of our records clean. Sure. Well, yeah. because you're the systems guy. Yeah. <laughs> Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, well, this is great. And is this, this is also on the Airtable universe as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Both bases are. Great. Um, so if any one of our audience wanted to start um, with either this example that we're currently seeing, the CRM, or with the financial ledger that we looked at a little bit earlier, they're available on the Airtable universe, and I will have the links to that in the description. Um, so another benefit of using Airtable is that you can use not only the pre-made Airtable templates, but um, bases made by users like yourself available on the universe uh, so that you don't have to start from scratch. Um, it's not going to come with the zaps that have been set up, I feel like I should mention, but um, you know, you were able to figure it out. How, just quickly, how, what was that kind of process like? Um, starting to build in, you said about five or six um, integrations for this base in particular. What was it like kind of learning the ropes? Yeah, um, before I set it up, I was doing everything manually, like updating, inputting everything manually. And the data was just really messy because there's so much room for human error. Like I would update it in one place and forget to update it in another. And so it was just taking up too much of my time. And so um, I had heard about if this then that like a while ago, but I'd never really explored it. And so I started looking around for these automating, you know, services and stumbled upon Zapier and found that it was pretty easy to set up. I mean, Zapier does a good job of walking you through step by step and they have some good tutorials online as well. So I didn't find it too too hard i mean it's a lot of it's just trial and error as well like just sure. seeing what works what doesn't yeah yeah so if you have um like yourself if you have um a particular use case that isn't quite covered by Airtable's automations which are at the time of this recording still a little bit new um and don't have as many um uh direct integrations available something like zapier or integromat are great places to automate your um, base making. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. This was great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> like I said, we'll have links to the bases in the description below. Um, is there anything you want to impart on our listeners before we sign off? Um, no, I, I just think the more I've leaned into Airtable and these other productivity apps, the more efficient my work and the work of my team has become. And so I, you know, for those who are skeptical out there, I just encourage you go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Vote of confidence. You can do it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. Well, thanks for being on. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the episode, be sure to give it a like or hit us up on social at Built On Air. We always love to hear your comments and suggestions. And don't forget to subscribe to catch new episodes when they release. It helps us keep the podcast going.